Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Joel Diedrich. I am uh, VP and GM of the Kumo Scale uh, Network Shared Software BU at Toshiba Memory America. Um, I am not primarily going to talk about Kumo Scale today, however. Uh, we are making a, a major announcement today of a new tool that we are providing to the uh, data center community for simulating data center orchestration. How many of you are really into data center orchestration? Ah, everybody, good. All right, so what is orchestration for the rest of you? Uh, what is orchestration and why should I care? Orchestration is the automated mapping of work to machines. Um, for most of us, we uh, go into our corporate uh, IT center and ask the IT guys, um, what are those machines used for over there? They will say, well, that's accounting's machines, those belong to engineering, et cetera, et cetera, and they would not think of of uh, swapping work between them, what orchestration can do is to run the same work with fewer machines, handle demand spikes uh, without reserving resources, uh, and, and et cetera. And it turns out the, the savings associated with this technique are just jaw-dropping. They've been measured by Google and others, and they are big. Uh, so what are the sources of waste that we're going to get rid of? Um, there are two. There are reserved resources, which is extra capacity that you provide to handle demand spikes. And stranded resources, which are tougher to understand. Stranded resources are the DRAM that is uh, not used by a CPU-bound application, the CPU capacity that's not used by a memory hog application, and so on. Um, the, the seasonal demand spikes are, are an interesting thing. Uh, uh, the Kuma Scale customer base includes uh, uh, consumer-facing applications that are delivered over the web to billions of users, and they tend to have uh, you know, seasonal spikes that are pretty profound. Obviously, if you're a marketplace, Black Friday and the Christmas season is when uh, you know, things hit the fan for you, um, most of these customers still today, even though they're quite sophisticated, run many big data centers of their own, uh, their technique for handling these spikes today is to just buy more machines and let them sit idle all year and then fire them up uh, for Christmas. Um, the uh, the uh, ride-sharing companies we also serve have, have some interesting spikes of their own that are um, New Year's Eve, when you can understand why you wouldn't want to drive home from the party, and strangely enough, Halloween, when you don't want to run over the trick-or-treaters. So in both cases and many other cases, there are spikes that could be seasonal, could be time of day, time of week, uh, depending on, on who you serve. Um, and the question is, how do you handle them? These can easily be 300% of the background requirement. So what do you do? Uh, how do you avoid buying 3x more machines um, and letting them sit all year? The public cloud has solved this. I mean, Google solved this, Amazon solved it, Azure solved it. Um, the, this, this, uh, what I'm talking about today is a solution for the rest of us, those who don't have thousands of engineers to engineer their own um, uh, elasticity. Uh, however, the, the applications have to be uh, architected for elastic scalability. Um, legacy apps need not apply. And you need uh, all the state to be networked. Uh, on premise, uh, as I said, we buy enough resources, generally silo configuration that's dedicated, and they sit idle. Um, stranded resources uh, in the hyper-converged model are, um, or the shared nothing model, it's, it's simple to understand. Shared nothing, simple to understand, simple to administer. Every node is one of a few types, uh, generally five. We find that the, uh, most hardware teams have a memory heavy node, a storage heavy node, a GPU node, and maybe a couple of others. But it's inefficient. No matter how much CPU capacity you have or how much DRAM you chose, it's wrong most of the time. Um, so what can we learn from the public cloud? Um, Google published a wonderful paper several years ago where they um, ran a set of experiments to measure the impact of some of these variables, some of the variables about how their clusters are constructed, and find out what factors really matter and by how much. Uh, the methodology was to re record the actual workloads running in 15 Google cells, a Google cell is about 10K machines, um, and then ask their planning tool called Borg to replan those workloads with changed assumptions. So this is not a technical paper, it's an economic impact paper. Uh, and then remove or add machines until Borg could just barely find a solution and plot the results. And they were fascinating. 
they experimented with siloing workloads, which is the word that, that means running them the way we tend to run them today. Um, each application gets its own set of machines that's sized for its particular peak, and uh, applications are not allowed to share machines, so if a human is doing the orchestration, this is how it works. Humans can't really blend, you know, um, handle enough free variables to blend applications. So this is what would happen um, if you ran your infrastructure this way. This is a cumulative distribution graph, it's a little hard to understand, but what it basically says is the median case, the middle of the road case, required 30% more machines for the same work. So let that soak in. At Google scale, 30% more machines is a big number, a lot of zeros. 30% more machines for the same amount of work. The reason our corporations haven't gotten onto this yet is we don't have millions of machines, but as our, as our IT infrastructure grows, this becomes more and more important. Fine-grained resource allocation. When you, uh, um, when you want to run a job and you tell your IT guy, you know, I think I need a lot of memory, you better give me 128 gigabytes of memory, and I need a, you know, a modest size CPU or whatever, maybe 12 cores. That's not how things work at Google, it turns out that even bucketing resources into powers of two, asking users what they need um, and letting them choose from one, two, four, or eight megabytes, costs 40% more machines for the same work. At Google, when you want to run an application, you don't specify memory in, in megabytes or gigabytes, you specify it in bytes. You don't specify compute capacity in cores, you specify it in micro cores. So fi fine grain um, optimization is the point here. Um, this, is, this is the biggie, the, uh, the notion of locality, the notion that we can put all the nodes running some application in the same rack and somehow treat them differently. If you reduce the network neighborhood of, of what Google calls a cell um, from 10,000 machines to 1,000, which is still you know, a reasonable sized cluster, it takes 70% more machines to do the same work. So the, the prize is pretty good size here. Um, the implications are you know, no dedicated hardware, no rack locality. You've got to have fully dynamic orchestration. And any instance has to be able to run anywhere. We cannot impose locality constraints, which means um, instances can't be pinned to nodes by virtue of the fact that the storage is pinned to the nodes. We need the storage visible from anywhere. And the payoff can be big, as I said, but it's also highly variable. You're, it depends a lot on your workload. And so in an effort to help our customers and, and the community understand what the potential benefits of orchestration might be, uh, we're announcing a tool that we'll make available to the community. It is a simulator that simulates the process of orchestrating your actual workloads, assigning them to your infrastructure, and allows you to do what Google did, to change the assumptions and find out how much difference it will make. Um, it's a tool for evaluating scheduling policies with your compute node configuration, your refresh schedule. If you buy machines every six months or every year or whatever, and that's the, the rate at which new infrastructure can be added, um, your actual application resource profiles and whatever your seasonal variation is, it will be uh, available to simulate the orchestration problem and, and tell you what's there to be gained. The, the assumptions are obviously applications have to be scale out. We're assuming here that more instances is how you get more throughput. This is not a legacy uh, scale up kind of world. And the application categories are stateless. If you uh, are familiar with uh, Kubernetes and some of the other recent orchestration tools, you'll recognize the distinction between stateless and stateful. Um, whether that's the distinction, I think, uh, in Kubernetes world, this is the difference between cattle and pets. Cattle are uh, indistinguishable from each other and can be uh, killed or, or uh, bred, I guess. Pets, uh, you know by name and, and uh, you care about each individual one. Um, so we have stateless and stateful and also batch. Batch jobs uh, are things that can be deferred. The other two have to meet current demand. If, the, uh, if it's Black Friday, you can't defer processing your customer's uh, uh, shopping cart, you need to do it now. But if you have a machine learning team, as almost all of us do now, that's consuming resources, training their models, that could be deferred till tomorrow, as long as we give them some reasonable amount of average throughput. And we test three scheduling policies. Siloed, uh, a mixed policy where stateless instances can be remapped every day, 
uh, and then a dynamic policy where both stateless and stateful, stateful can be remapped. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, the matrix of, of how that looks um, and, the, and the, the restrictions associated with that matrix. And so the inputs, um, you describe your actual compute nodes, and I, it, the tool currently hand, handles only one compute node type, it may, we may extend it in the future to, to handle a, a little more diversity, but you specify the number of cores, amount of memory and memory bandwidth, flash capacity, and so on. Um, you specify the demand profile of your business. If, are, do you have Christmas spikes? Do you have New Year's Eve spikes? Do you have any seasonal or time of day spikes? Uh, and also what background growth rate. And then finally, and this is the important part, for every major application, for every major workload, you tell us what the consumption, resource consumption of each instance is um, in, in those same terms. The, the uh, baseline demand, how many instances need to be running as a baseline, and whether or not the peaks that you specified apply. Uh, see here. The computation is, uh, is complex, takes a little while, it runs uh, typically several minutes. Um, what it does is it remaps every application onto the infrastructure every day for a three year period. During that three year period, the demand grows according to the growth rate and the seasonality that you specified, and then it adds hardware at your data center refresh interval. For each scheduling policy, it does a binary search to find the exact number of machines needed to run your workload with your throughput specification. For every attempt in the binary search, uh, we schedule every application on every machine for the entire three years. So it's computationally pretty intense. Um, find the optimum job ma mapping consistent with the policy. Uh, that uses a, a, um, a tool called vector bin packing uh, which is a, a, sort of an interesting thing. Uh, this is a little picture of vector bin packing. Uh, the bin is the red container, um, and the game here is to, to fit a number of odd-shaped uh, things into the container, if, uh, optimally, to leave as little spare space, unused space as possible. It's obvious from this picture that small things work better than large things, if you care about efficiency. Um, this is a uh, mathematically intractable problem. It's called NP-hard in complexity theory, but good heuristics are known, and we've used one of those that gets a very good but not perfect answer. Um, in our context, why does that matter? Well, the bins are compute nodes. They have you know, a certain amount of memory and a certain amount of compute power and so on. Objects are application instances, and the game is to pack application instances into bins. So. Um, if we had a two-dimensional example, we might have DRAM and CPU, and you can see a CPU-bound application and a memory hog. Um, the, the leftover space, when we're all done, we call bin packing loss. That's the inefficiency associated with doing a poor job of consuming all of the resources and stranding some of them in an unusable state. Vector bin packing just means we're doing it in more than two dimensions. You can, you can see three dimensions here. Um, in our case, we're doing it in five dimensions and this can be extended arbitrarily. It gets uh, exponentially harder, obviously, as you add a dimension. So the dynamic remapping that we're doing every day, uh, why does it help? Why is it good? Um, step one, as I said, you have to disaggregate the storage. You have to get the storage out of the individual nodes because, as you recall, every instance needs to be able to run anywhere. And to give the planner enough flexibility to do a good job of bin packing, you need to untie its hands by saying, okay, I'm not pinning this instance to this node anymore, I'm allowing you to move it wherever you like. And then you handle demand spikes by resharding. You um, kill some instances of a batch job that can be deferred. Um, you start some more instances of the job that's under stress and uh, you get near instant response and data doesn't need to be moved, which is a key, key point here. Interpreting the results, the results come out in a graph like this. Um, this is every day, day from day zero to, to three years. Um, the the uh, saturated colors are the number of equivalent machines used, the number of resources are used. So on the left side you can see that that's a compute node count. Batch jobs are using uh, just over 5,000 nodes, stateful a couple of thousand and stateless uh, several thousand more. And you can see the, the uh, Peaks, the seasonal peaks in demand. This is a Christmas rush uh, scenario. Um, 
scheduling loss, that is machines that are not needed for most of the year but are needed during the spikes are shown in the same color but, um, but, more, but lighter. Bin packing loss is shown in gray at the top. And so the total number of machines required is the red line at the top. And as you can see, if we were siloing, um, doing things the way they're typically done today, you'd be buying 25 plus thousand machines in the first year to run this workload and adding a couple thousand per year after that. Um, how can we optimize? How can we do better? First, disaggregate the ephemeral flash, move it out of the uh, individual nodes and share it. That has some benefits. Storage can now be provisioned optimally. So storage is one of our, um, our bin pack dimensions. We're no longer stranding storage in nodes that don't need the amount that happens to be in an SSD. And so naturally, we're going to reduce bin packing loss. Um, the bigger prize, however, is to orchestrate the workloads and blend them optimally. Um, disaggregating flash but, but still using silos is not, not the whole way to the, to the promised land here. So now we want applications to be able to scale quickly to respond to demand. And an interesting, subtle thing happens here. You can notice that the demand spikes turned upside down here. So what's going on? What does that mean? What we're doing is we're stealing resources from the batch workload at the bottom. The batch workload at the bottom is being suspended during the spikes. Um, we're starting more instances of the uh, real-time applications that are under stress, um, but without buying extra machines and without having machines wait uh, for those spikes to occur. And then when the, when the uh, stress is over, we return the uh, machines to their, to their background use. And then again, this is possible only if we have automated blending and we can run any instance anywhere. So the key pieces here are optimum scheduling, Kubernetes or its equivalent, and storage disaggregation, which is provided by Kumoscale. Um, uh, the call to action, if you will, uh, th this uh, tool is in uh, private beta now. It'll emerge uh, into the public within the next few weeks. If you'd like to uh, get a URL and have an opportunity to use it, please uh, give me your card, or better yet, stop by the uh, uh, Toshiba booth, which is in the far corner. We also have a uh, manual bin packing uh, kit here. This actually is a uh, bin pack t-shirt. This is Kumo scale and a uh, wireless speaker. And you can figure, if you can collect enough of these, you can figure out how to pack them into the trunk of your car or whatever. Um, use the tool, analyze your workloads, find out how many dollars are at stake. Figure out what this is worth. And once you know that, come and connect with us and we'll talk about how to disaggregate your flash. Uh, we'll give you tips from our um, solutions team on kind of best practices of how to get from where you are to, uh, to this sort of orchestrated, disaggregated solution. Thanks very much.